We've now reached our final session on our series, The Unstoppable Church Begins. We've looked at three churches, Jerusalem, Caesarea and Antioch. And today in our final session, we are revisiting the church at Antioch. The last time we read of the church at Antioch is when Paul is setting out on his third missionary journey. And he says, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Acts chapter 18, verse 23. But we're looking a few years earlier when it's about AD 53, just about 20 or more years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. Like all the churches, Antioch could look back over those last 20 years and see how God had been at work in their lives. There were many influences that had shaped their journey over the years and enabled them to become what they were. And I just want to highlight a few of these and let them challenge us about ourselves. What have the church of Antioch become? If we were there at Antioch, we would see that the church was diverse and multicultural. The city of Antioch was a Roman colony, possibly the third largest in the empire. It had a mainly Gentile population although there was a large Jewish contingent. At the start of the church, back in Jerusalem, persecution had arisen and those in Jerusalem, the Christians in Jerusalem, Jerusalem were being scattered. And as things were getting worse, they were scattered everywhere. Some of those went up to Antioch to preach to the Jews. They would have gone into the synagogues and they began to preach Jesus. But at the same time, there were others who went to Antioch to speak, and it says they went to speak to the Greeks, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. In ministering to the Jews and to the Gentiles, this caused some debate as to how to match up the religious observances and the life of Jew and Gentile and although the issue wouldn't be formally settled until a conference in Jerusalem later but in Peter's mind it was already settled Peter said I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism Acts chapter 10 verse 34 of course Jesus had already told the disciples that they were to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, verse 19. And in a vision that John had, one of Jesus' disciples, in a vision that he had, and we read it in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9, as that vision showed him a picture of, of the far distant future, he says he saw in heaven a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were there from everywhere. It wasn't just those who were of a different religious background that were brought together but there were those of different ethnic and social backgrounds. And we see this perhaps in the leaders who came to the church at Antioch. Those leaders came from every cultural and social background and it's their presence that influenced the church. So we read in Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Altogether in Antioch, 
we know the names of 10 people who spent some time there, some time ministering into the church. And as well as the five who were mentioned in this verse, we have Agabus. Agabus was a prophet who came from Jerusalem and he pro prophetically told the church about a severe famine that would spread over the entire Roman world. There was Judas Persebus and Silas who brought confirmation of what had happened at the Jerusalem conference and who stayed on and we read in Acts chapter 15 verse 32 Judas and Silas who themselves were prophets said much to encourage and strengthen their believers. There was John Mark who came with Paul from Jerusalem and who then went with Paul on Paul's first missionary journey. And finally, there was Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. He was one of the seven, seven men who were chosen, seven men who were full of the spirit and full of wisdom, and they were given the responsibility of overseeing the care of those who had been overlooked in the daily distribution of food. But what about the ones that we mentioned in the verse that we read? Those who were present together in the church. The verse read, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. There was Barnabas. Barnabas' birth name was Justus, and it was only later that he was given the nickname Barnabas. He was a foreigner by place of birth. He was born in Cyprus, but he was Jewish by heritage. He was of the tribe of Levi. He was living in Jerusalem when we first read of him. He owned some land and he sold a field and he brought the money to help support the new Christian community. And over the course of time, he found his way to Antioch. There was Simeon called Niger, and Niger is the Latin for black. Simeon wasn't Jewish by birth. He was probably of African descent. How his journeys brought him to Antioch right to the heart of the church, right to the time when they were laying hands on Paul and Barnabas as they set off on their first missionary journey, we don't really know, we can only wonder. But also there was Lucius of Cyrene. Lucius was from North Africa, from Cyrene in Libya. Whether he was one of the crowd who were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, where it says that there were those from all nations and they were there from Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, whether that's when he found Christ as his saviour, we don't know. Again, we can only surmise. There was Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Menaeid had been brought up in a household that was both rich and evil. It was Herod who had ordered the death of John the Baptist. It was Herod, it says, who ridiculed and mocked and wanted to kill Jesus. We read this in Luke chapter 23. Menaeum was brought up in that atmosphere and in that prejudice but he found Jesus he knew the reality of the power of the gospel to reach into every strata of society and finally we have Saul whose life story before he became a Christian was as we read in Acts chapter 22 verse 3 and he was telling his story I am a Jew, born in, in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors, 
I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. But then, as we probably know, he met Jesus and his life was changed radically forever. Ten people, all radically different backgrounds, all coming from different areas of life, all of different nationalities. But in Christ, they had been brought into one family together. As Paul was later to write in his letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. And even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And if Antioch is to serve as a model for us, then the reality of our vision statement has to live, be lived out. And in part of our vision statement, it says, we see a church where there are people of all nationalities, ages and backgrounds. If we were there at Antioch, we would know that the church was a church of the Holy Spirit and of the Word of God. At the church, it says there were prophets and teachers. We read it. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. There were leaders in the church who brought prophetic words from God. There were leaders in the church who brought teaching from God's word into the church. We must never see these two different aspects as competing. We will never see it as it's either one or the other. We must never really see it as a bit of one and a bit of the other. But we must pursue all that God has for us in every way we can. Jesus had said that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. John 16 verse 13. But it said that God's word is truth. John 17 verse 17. And he said about himself, If you hold to my teaching, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8 verse 31. And he said, Worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4 verse 24. So we see a church that was a church of the Holy Spirit. As we look through the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit at work in many, in all of the churches. And Antioch was no different. When we read of Barnabas, who went down to Antioch, it says, He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people who were brought to the Lord. Coming into Antioch was Barnabas, a man full of the Holy Spirit. There was Agabus. Agabus was a prophet. He came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and it says through the Spirit he predicted that a severe famine would spread over all the entire Roman world and this enabled the church to make their plans to get aid through to Judea. Agabus came and through the Spirit he spoke into the church. And just after the verse we read in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says, While the leaders were worshipping and fasting, it says, The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Every church needs to be a church full of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
it's not just for leaders, but for everyone. Paul's challenge to us is the same as he, the one that he gave to the church at Ephesus, that should, we should be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Of course, the work of the Holy Spirit wasn't just confined to inside the church. It says that in response to the Spirit's leading, Barnabas and Saul set out on their first missionary journey. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Acts chapter 13 verse 4. And at that first place they arrived at, in Cyprus, we read that Saul, full, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas, and he spoke into the situation that had developed on Cyprus. And right through Paul's journeys, right to the very end, on the last of Paul's missionary journeys, it talks about him being compelled by the Spirit to make his journey to Jerusalem. What was demonstrated in the church and at Antioch and what was seen as an ongoing experience from those who moved out of Antioch is our example. A church and a life full of the Holy Spirit. But we also see that the church was a church of the Word of God. One of great, the great strengths of this church was the value placed on teaching. We know right from the very first days after the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem that the apostles, it says, they entered the temple courts as they had been told by an angel and began to teach the people. And this had transferred down through the years till we get to Antioch. And when Barnabas and Saul were at Antioch, it says, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, for a whole year they met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Barnabas and Saul for a year were teaching into the church. In a different sort of example, after the Jerusalem Council, when they returned to Antioch and they delivered the decisions that had been made about the tension between Jew and Gentile, and they read out the outcome of the theological issues, we read that the people read it and were glad for the message. Or as it says in the New Living Translation, oh, there was great joy throughout the church that day. And a teaching and an explanation of the word of God, it should do that for us, bring us great joy. Later on again, we read that Paul and Barnabas again were in Antioch, along with many others, and they preached and they taught the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 15, verse 35. In the church, some, like Paul, were thoroughly grounded in what the Old Testament said. It was part of their upbringing and training. We read it. Paul's testimony was, I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. But others who became Christians knew absolutely nothing. And everybody needed to be taught about what God was saying in the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament hadn't yet been written. So they had to be taught about Jesus his life, his teaching, his ministry. And they had to be taught about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's what Paul believed for every church. When he went to Ephesus some years later, it says that in Ephesus, Paul taught the church for two years. Acts chapter 19, verses 10 and 20. 
so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power for us. Everything we do and believe has to be based on God's word. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul wrote and said, All scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Finally, if we were in the church at Antioch, we would realise that the church was missional and evangelistic. From its foundations, from those who came to start the church at Antioch, it reflected this character. Jesus had said that he would build his church and he instructed those who would become his followers to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Mark 16 verse 15. And he also said that they were to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And we see this in the church, being li uh, Antioch, being lived out in the lives of those who were there. The church started because there were those who were committed to these words of Jesus. Some had travelled 700 kilometres from Jerusalem and went to the Jewish community in Antioch and told them of Jesus. Others travelled and they came originally from overseas in Cyprus and North Africa. But they went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks. And it says, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus, Acts chapter 11, verse 20. And it says in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The church had started and the church was growing. Antioch was a large city. It was culturally and ethnically diverse. And it was in this environment that the church grew. People were crossing the boundaries set up by the culture they'd been brought up in and they became known as Christians. The Christians in Antioch were so identifiable that this group in the city were given the new name of Christians. It says, verse 26 of Acts chapter 11, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The impact on the city was so great. But then the Holy Spirit challenged them to reach out further. And under the leading of the Holy Spirit, the church prayed for Barnabas and Saul and they set off. They set off through Cyprus, Iconium, Lystra, Derby and many other places. And they were preaching the gospel, setting up churches and teaching the church until they eventually sailed back to Antioch. And what we see is that this wasn't just a two-man mission of Barnabas and Saul, but it was a whole church involvement, a whole church enterprise of the church that they belonged to. We read in Acts chapter 14, verse 27, on arriving there, that's back at Antioch, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Antioch was their home church. Antioch was their sending church. Antioch was their supporting church. After the next missionary journey, it was back to Antioch that Paul came. And for every church, we see a model that we can adopt. Some in church, some in the church, will reach out globally on mission. 
and a ministry because that will be their gifting and calling in God. Others in the church will reach out and build the church locally because of their calling and gifting in God. But for all of us, we must reach out to build the kingdom. And so we see, the church at Antioch was diverse. It was full of the Holy Spirit. It was full of the teaching of God's word. And it was evangelistic, it was missional in Antioch. It was missional in Outlook. That was Antioch. And that is the church that Jesus is building.